Kaczynski has published uh, many articles and books on uh, these topics. And Julian, uh, like Bjarke, also comes from a global history perspective or very often works uh, within this uh, framework. Julian um, is an assistant professor at the University of uh, Vienna and is going to talk about the philosophical society in India between reform and tradition. So we are looking forward to this, Julian, and uh, the word is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, is the uh, presentation visible? Am I audible? Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you, even though just on screen, I hope we can reconvene as soon as possible in a more pleasant format. But there are some advantages to this. So uh, it's perhaps nice that we have a larger audience than usual. Uh, so let me get going. In what follows, I am going to demonstrate the Theosophical Society's relationship with so-called modern and traditional movements in Bengal by situating them within a broader global historical framework that takes into account uh, both diachronic and synchronic perspectives, combines micro and macro historical perspectives, and explores global connections that shape local developments. My main example will be the tantric pundit Shivchandra Dharnop or Shiva Chandra Vidyanova in a more Sanskritized form uh, and his disciples and affiliates, including the British judge John Woodroff, who worked in Kolkata from 1890 to 1922. These authors are connected through Arthur Avalon, a pseudonym long believed to represent Woodruff only, but that actually stood for a collaboration between learned South Asians, mainly Bengalis, who presented Tantra as the esoteric core, not only of true Dharma, but also of a universal religion of mankind. The editions, translations, and studies published, published by the Avalon team, among the first of which was Ship Chandos Magnum Opus Tantro Toto, transformed scholarly and popular perceptions of Tantra, almost single-handedly established its serious academic study, and still serve as an inspiration for researchers and practitioners alike. The links between Woodroff and Shiv Chandra are not only evident in light of their guru-disciple relationship, but also through the textual corpus that structured the Avalon project. Centering on the Bengali Mahanirvana Tantra, a main authority for Chip Chandra and many others in Bengal, and the latter's major opus, the aforementioned Tantra Toto, which was directly translated as the famous Principles of Tantra, which I'm also using uh, to balance my lecture text on. So I, I would like to show you this very appropriate contraption that my camera wouldn't allow. Uh, anyway, uh, theosophy, and that's my crucial point here, was a major factor in the developments that led to these publications. In fact, the circles around Shiv Chandra had initiated their propagation of a specific understanding of Tantra decades earlier prior to Wadov's arrival in Bengal. In 1880, Buruda Kanto Mojumdar heralded a wave of Bengali contributions to the Theosophist that should initiate, as Kalbaya has first pointed out, a far-reaching transformation of understandings of Tantra and yoga. Theosophy then evidently formed a crucial nodal point for these exchanges, and it was immediately linked to the Avalon project. Not only did Boruda Kanto write an over 100 pages long introduction to the second term of principles of Tantra, Woodruff too had close links to the Theosophical Society. His wife, Ellen, was a member. The couple was well acquainted with any peasant, for instance, and among John's relatives was Alan Octavian Hume, and John himself wrote for theosophical journals, gave lectures to the society, to several branches, and published most of his books with Ganesh and Company, a theosophical press. The truly global impact and emergence of this collaboration allows for demonstrating entanglements between local and global contexts. Two institutional examples to which all our actors were connected will further illuminate the networks for which these exchanges emerged and unfolded. 
on one hand, self-referentially orthodox dharma societies, and on the other hand, the theosophical society. These examples will highlight the historiographical complications arising from strict distinctions between modernity and tradition, but also binary cultural models such as East and West or Hindu and non-Hindu. Not least, my discussion will point out uh, or will point at fundamental challenges pertaining to the predominant focus on English educated colonial elites, in this case, the Bengali middle class known as Bodolok, but also on the historic, historiographical isolation of so-called traditional actors from the sphere of the modern. Issues that have recently been addressed by scholars such as Brian Hatcher, Richard Weiss, or Lucian Wong and Ferdinando Sardella. It bears emphasis that Shipchondo's Tontro Toto was among the first publications of Arthur Avalon, translated, as I pointed out, as the two volume principles of Tantra. I will demonstrate that on one hand, this proclamation of a specific understanding of Tantra can only be comprehended when viewed both diachronically and synchronically against the background of Bengali culture. And on the other hand, that it must also be understood in light of global exchanges as the Avalon project was the direct outcome of interactions between Chipchondo's disciples with the Theosophical Society beginning as early as in 1880. In order to understand Shipchandra's claim that the secret or one could say esoteric Nigur core of Tantra constituted a true orthodoxy as it was claimed of so-called Aryan Sanatana Dharma, I would like to open my discussion with the Dharma societies. Their investigation is not least difficult because they can hardly be situated on a neat modernity tradition or reform revival axis, which is further complicated by the sheer heterogeneity of such groups, at least with respect uh, to the role and status of the Tantras, as opposed to the Vedas and other corpora such as the Puranas. The formation of these societies falls into the 1880s. The proponents profess to defend Sanatana Dharma against both Western influences and Indian reformers who were allegedly corrupted by said influences. The leading figures in the organization of so-called Hindu orthodoxy in late 19th century Bengal were the English educated Krishna Prashama Shen and Shoshoda Tokuchuramuni, a pundit with a Sanskritic education. In 1880, Krishna founded the Indian Society for the Propagation of Aryan Dharma, which professed to, I quote, propagate Sanatan Hinduism as manifest in the sacred Vedas and thus to encourage the salvation of the current common man, as well as to further the study and, pro uh, study and propagation of the Aryan religion and culture. The society was dedicated to the revival of Aryan religion as expounded in the Vedas, Tantras, and Puranas. In 1900, numerous societies were united under the Bharat Dharma Mahamanda, which had convened in Delhi under the presidency of the Maharaja of Dalbanga, Rameshwa Singh who had also been a donor of the BADPS. I'm not going to pronounce this very long name every time. So the BDM established 600 branches, was affiliated with 400 institutions and employed nearly 200 preachers, not a very marginal affair. Chip Chandra was among the most vocal proponents of Sanatana Dharma and denounced its degeneration through foreign influences. His proclamation of Tantra as the core of Sanatana Dharma becomes plausible when viewed against the deeper diachronic background of Bengali culture and its centers of learning, Nubodip and Krishnagar. In this region of Nodia and adjacent districts, the Tantras had been firmly incorporated into Dharma Shastra and Smriti for centuries. As scholars such as Kunal Chakraborty, Jonathan Ganaji, uh, uh, Joshua Ehrlich, uh, Joel Bordeaux, etc., have shown, this was anything but an intellectually isolated sphere, neither with regard to the so called West or with regard uh, to exchanges between Vaishnavas, Shaktas, and Muslims, and others. 
Chip Chondro grew up in this vivid atmosphere and received his education in Nobody. He would later position himself mainly against the influence of English education and significantly refused to learn the English language. In his Tondro Toto, we can observe how local rivalries and debates intermingled with the anti-colonial stance of his author. On one hand, he engaged critically with Bengali Vaishnava traditions and Vedantic philosophy, which at the time mostly referred to the Brahmos, the members of the Brahmo Samaj. On the other hand, he denounced English education and the reform movements allegedly corrupted by it, as a, for instance, the Brahmo Samaj and the Arya Samaj. In the 1890s, Shib Chandra established his own self-referentially orthodox society that opposed Western influence by invoking the Aryan Sanatana Dharma. This society was named after Sholbo Mongola, uh, the Sholbo Mongola Shoba, Shib Chandra's Ishtadi. It professed to cure the diseased body of society in the words of one of his disciples. This was to be accomplished by two aims. First, the struggle against Western material science by promoting the eternal Vedic Dharma and opposing the propaganda of Western materialist capitalists. And second, it should bridge the divisions between Shakta and Vaishnava factions and establish religious and social unity between them. The founding members of the Sharma Mongola Shabha consisted of a range of prominent and remarkably diverse figures, among them the aforementioned Shoshodor. We also find the Vedanta pandit Kalibar Vedanta Bagish, who would later, by recommendation of Shoshodor, become the teacher of Swami Abhidananda of the um, Krishna Vedanta Mad. And it is perhaps most remarkable to encounter Vijay Krishna Goswami, the famous Vaishnava reformer who had previously been a follower of the Brahmo Samaj. Chip Chandra himself propagated his ideas in public speeches, notably also during the Swadeshi period, where he linked Tantra to anti colonial nationalism, as well as in numerous publications. A leading theme is the promise of a transition from a period of darkness and decay to one of light and regeneration. For instance, in the opening scene of Rashlila from 1896, which revolves around the fundamental unity between Shaktas and Vaishnavas. Shib Jondro lamented that almost no one was left to offer initiation into the secret principles Nigo Toto of the Shastras. Without the flowering of the knowledge of Brahma, Brahma Bida, truth would forever be beyond the grasp of common sense. The same theme can be observed in Gongesh, a play about the founder of Navayaya, Gongesha Upadaya. In the preface, Shib Chandra emphasized that in secret, again, Nigur Bhabe, the truth was germinating to blossom again and illuminate the minds of the ignorant. The rhetoric of orthodoxy, of Brahmanical orthodoxy in particular, of decay and regeneration, of the lost secret wisdom of the Aryan rishis that awaited its revival, could also be encountered in the Theosophical Society. The society's prominent cultural political involvement in India is often acknowledged by scholarship, but rarely explored in detail. Prominent global historians like Jürgen Osterhammer, for instance, noted the particular impact, quote, of the society, but eventually regards it in a somewhat cliched fashion as the expression of a, quote, irrationalism polemically counterposed to the Western faith in reason. Recently, Sebastian Conrad highlighted theosophy as, I quote, the prototype of a transnationally active religion, but his discussion remains cursory. Classic works in South Asian studies too highlight the society's relevance, but do not focus on it, such as those by Tapan Roy Chaudhary and Amir um, Shen about Hindu revivalism. 
from within post-colonial studies, Gaudi Vishwamatan, for instance, has dealt with theosophy in some detail. However, by exclusively focusing on colonial power structures or their mirroring, and someone somewhat contradictory to her apparent intention on white Western theosophists and Anglophone sources. The in-depth and high quality research that does exist on theosophy on the other hand, is mainly produced within the framework of Western esotericism, which follows a diffusionist Eurocentric export model and too focuses on white Western theosophists. There is, in short, a pressing need to pay increased attention to, well, non-Western actors, an awkward designation that in itself highlights the misleading dichotomization of West and the rest. To this end, anyway, I'm here going to focus on theosophy's entanglement with the Indian intellectual landscape, stressing that theosophy did not simply export a Western esotericism to India, but was instead confronted with a plethora of rivaling uh, Indian interests that must be explored in their own right, within their local and diachronic contexts. I'm here concentrating on theosophy's close ties to both self-referentially self reformist and orthodox cohorts. The latter become particularly obvious in light of the fact that we encounter none other than Alcott among the founders of the Bharat Dharma Mahamanda. Ameshwar Singh, its patron and general secretary, was an ardent supporter of theosophy and co-founded with uh, Annie Besant, the Benares Hindu University. Shibchan Rochu appears to have attracted the attention of the Maharaja, who is said to have become one of his disciples and patronized the publication of Shibchan's writings. Ameshwar's elder brother and predecessor, Lokshmeshwar, had joined the society in 1883 and was a generous supporter of the Theosophical Kashi Tattva Lodge in Benares, whose reports were printed by none other than Shashadar's Veda Vyasa Press. The links between so-called Hindu revivalism and theosophy can be further illustrated by one of the early titles of the Bengali Theosophical Society, which was translated or which was dedicated to uh, the promotion of the meaning of the eternal Aryan Dharma and proclaimed the explanation of Romobida, a frequent translation of theosophy, in terms that similar to Shibchandra and other self referentially orthodox pundits revolved around the revival of Aryan civilization to meet the ailments of a corrupted modern age. A leading member in these early stages of philosophy was the aforementioned Boruda Kanto Mujumla, an educator from the Nodia region and a disciple of Shib Chandra. In 1880, he was the most vocal voice in what I call the Bengali intervention, an attempt in the theosophist to resignify the meaning of Tantra as the esoteric core of Aryan civilization. This is not least important because Boruna Kanto would, as you might recall, write the introduction to the second volume of Principles of Tantra titled The Signs of Tantric Spiritual Culture. Boruna Kanto quickly became an active theosophist. He was actually one of the earliest uh, members to join. He, his member number is very early. I forgot to take note of it. It's something like 600. And so it's really, really early. Anyway, he contributed to uh, Tukaram Tatya's well-known Guide to Theosophy from 1887, founded a theosophical school, and edited the journal Kolpo, the mouthpiece of the Bengali Theosophical Society for the promotion of the meaning of the eternal alien Dharma. In the journal's pages, we learn about the wish for the initiation, the, the heralding of a new golden age, which is basically the meaning of, of Kolpo. Uh, so the, the first editorial actually says Kolpo like, Uta, which means like the, the dawning of, of, of that age. And that age uh, should be initiated through the decryption of the secret, well, you could say esoteric, 
uh, meaning of the Arian scripture. So this term was also translated as esoteric, but uh, can also be used uh, as, as a secret. And when I say it was translated and by actors such as Buddha Kanto. Theosophy is presented by such actors as the quote, pinnacle of science that we can read by Buddha Kanto in Kolpo whose true meaning, however, is always hidden to the average people. While much could be said about these exchanges, my crucial point here is that the Indian members and interlocutors of the Theosophical Society did not simply react to a sudden import of Western ideas, but they actively expressed ideas that must be historicized within their local contexts, which in turn had already been shaped by manifold cultural exchanges that conditioned and structures the fruitful exchange between these tantrikas and theosophy. Arthur Avalon then, to conclude, was chiefly the outcome of Bengali efforts that can be traced back at least to the 1880s and must be viewed against the deeper background of tantra in Bengal. The central role of theosophy in these exchanges underlines the need for a decentered historiography to comprehend this development. It would be misleading to view it in terms of an export or a diffusion of Western knowledge or esotericism in particular to India or elsewhere. Rather, we are dealing with truly globally entangled multidirectional exchanges. It would also be too simplistic to regard these exchanges as a clash between modernity and tradition, specifically if modernity is equal with westernization. I hope to have illustrated an approach that might help to illuminate some of these historical intricacies that still inform our perception of subjects like Tantra, esotericism, or revivalism. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Julian, for this um, paper, which I think opens a lot of new avenues for understanding theosophy in India slash Indian theosophy and uh, the context that are involved in this. And um, now the floor is open for questions. So please write in the chat or raise your hand if you have a comment or a question for Julian. One, one initial uh, question I might want to ask you, Julian, I don't know if you've come across this, but um, you might be familiar with the perspective that Christopher Megan, uh, I mean, um, Christopher Partridge, he has formulated that the philosophists, they in a way came to India and they brought with them this notion of esotericism or esoteric. And this was in a way a kind of a, an, an export it was not something that belonged to that context. It was kind of pressured on them uh, and it you know, changed their own, under own understanding. But it seems from what you are saying also in a way that even this notion of the esoteric was not necessarily um, an export because this whole discourse of secrecy and secret tantra and all these things were actually a part of uh, a self-understanding in India at the same time, a part of the, the way of, uh, you know, um, talking about your own doctrines and teachings and so forth that uh, that could maybe show that you know this is higher knowledge in a way this is beyond what other groups and and traditions are talking about. So what do you think about that? I mean, do you think esoteric is a is a even even esoteric is a Western export uh, construct or did it actually also exist in some sense in this context in India at the time? Yeah, Christopher Partridge made an important point, and I think it's important to highlight that he did that in response to the concept of positive Orientalism. So what he argued against is that Orientalism, even if it's benign, 
uh, carries with it all this orientalist and colonialist and racialist and so on baggage. So even if you view from a uh, European perspective, Indians as the bearers of, of uh, ancient Aryan wisdom, you will find in, in these sources, including the theosophical ones, the idea that this goes hand in hand with a degeneration, with uh, this culture having remained static, stuck in the past or and or degenerated, that Indians are childlike, that they need instruction, that they, be, that they need guidance to understand their own doctrines again. And of course, we do have some quite racially connoted dynamics within the theosophical society. Uh, it's important to point that out. However, uh, this should not lead, and this is also something I criticized about uh, Vishwanathan, to an exclusive focus on those Western actors. So if you really want to be consequential and say we uh, want to unravel this, this whole mess of colonialism and, and Orientalism, then we do have to take into account the non-Western people and those who have been colonized who were not completely bereft of agency, which means that they, they of course were active, like they, they, they had ideas, they did things, they didn't passively accept everything that was thrown at them, they didn't import something, but they played an active role in the process. And, and this is the crucial point. When we zoom into the question of esotericism, uh, what I'm saying is not that there is some kind of esotericism that can be discovered in different kinds of the world. That is just my historical perspective, but that we do have, as a matter of fact, so this is what I, as a historian, focus on, that we do have these sources uh, penned, crafted by those very different actors across the world that debate the meaning of esotericism. So that's a fact, and we should depart from that, and we should look at how they do that. If we then look at our Bengali authors, then we see that they engage with this notion of esotericism in ways that they highlight their own local backgrounds, the traditions that, that have shaped their ideas, and of course, always keeping in mind that those traditions were not something monolithic, pristine, pure, untouched by anything, but already the uh, outcome of exchanges, and specifically since the 18th century and the British colonial period. So when those authors referred to or, or identified, entered dialogue with the newly arrived theosophists, they said, oh yeah, we, we have this secrecy, this need for, for initiation, for occult powers, Hidi, and uh, you, you are, you're kind of also discovering that with your mesmerism and your spiritualism and, and your occultism, and that's nice, but uh, you know, you're only scratching on the third surface of what we know for, for millennia already. So this is also a situation where we have a super fascinating uh, inversion of authority within the colonial context, because this concept of Aryan ancient wisdom as racially charged and orientalist as it was, enabled these actors to claim certain authority and uh, to assert their own position which was frequently stressed by Indian observers who were skeptical of the Theosophical Society. For instance, from the Brahmo camp, who said, okay, we don't really know what those guys are about. They talk about Aryan stuff and so on, okay. Uh, but uh, we don't really know what to make of this. However, they are the first ones uh, and they speak about English people in, in the quotes that I have in mind. Yeah, they are the first ones, the, the first Englishmen who come to us and want to learn from us instead of sending us to indigo farms or, <laughs> or just telling us what to do. So here we have very ambiguous dynamics. Thank you very much, Julian, for that um, elaboration of, of your, um, your research and, um, and for answering uh, my question. So um, we have a uh, few more uh, questions or comments in the in the chat here. I'll just uh, read this one from uh, Richard Mason. So Richard writes, I wanted to ask Julian why the focus on the 1880s in particular was uh, Makulianism opposed more actively in Bengal than in other parts of British India. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I, I see some people frowning, so I'll explain uh, briefly what the Macaulayism means. So there was a debate about the worth of uh, Oriental culture as opposed to Western culture. And Macaulay was somebody who basically, like, there's a famous quote, I, I don't know it by heart, but he basically said that in, 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 in an average household shelf in England, you find literature that is more worth than all literature that, that has ever been produced in India. Uh, it hasn't, I mean, the, the focus on the 1880s is not because of that, although it plays a big role in those debates at the time, obviously. Uh, but this is simply because the theosophist had recently arrived in India and the theosophist had recently been launched and the first issues had come out in 1879. So this Bengali initiative starts for simple chronological reasons at the time. Thank you. Perhaps I should briefly add that, of course, there is an engagement with uh, spiritualism, uh, new thought, and so on prior to theosophy. I just want to mention that it's interesting in itself. Definitely, yeah. So, so thank you uh, for explaining, um, Julian. And uh, we have uh, a big one, I think, maybe a too big a question here for um, for Julian uh, from Paulina about, you know, how do you define hysterism? Um, so, uh, I'm a religious studies guy, so uh, this is kind of my turf <laughs> when it comes to religion, you know. Uh, I don't define esotericism, I don't define religion. I try to understand how historical actors and also present day actors do that, and I try to understand how they do that, why they do that, in what context they do that. And I don't arrive as a at a definition in the end because that definition is never going to work. Like no matter what you try, like there's, there's a long history in religious studies trying to define religion. It never works, it will never work. Uh, it can be a many pages long definition, as open as you want, there will always be cases that don't fit it. So, and, and I don't have any problem with that, quite the contrary, I find that specifically fascinating and, and stimulating and, and interesting. So there's a constant need to really fine tune our research into what exactly we are looking at, how we are looking at it how we are situating it in specific historical context, what theoretical methodological lenses and tools we use and so on. So, uh, and this is always an open-ended uh, uh, and never ending uh, process. I, I hope this, this necessarily unsatisfying answer uh, is an answer in, of some sorts. <laughs> Thank you. Um... Are there any further questions for Julian? Okay. Jarke just asked very quickly, I, I will send it to you in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I just thought it was a bit off topic for your one. So, yeah. So, so you will chat, chat about this? Or? Yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's uh, all give uh, Julian a, a hand and a reaction on Zoom as a fans here. Oh, okay. thanks again. So now we will.